Between 1980 and 2004, every presidential election featured a Bush or a Clinton, or both on one of the major party tickets. That's 24 years, seven elections. And there was a Bush-Clinton pause during the Obama era, but in 2016, the Democratic and Republican establishments seemed determined to nominate Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. Many on both sides were asking, are you kidding me? Donald Trump was one of them. People had told pollsters for decades, you know what I want for president of the United States? Somebody with a ton of experience who's never been in government, never been in politics. You're thinking, well, who can that be? Trump had succeeded in rescuing himself from the hole that he dug himself into in New York. His brand was back, but he wanted to do something more with his life. Oh, that is some group of people, thousands. I was so nice. cheering Thank him on, and I was all for him. I was really revved up, so happy for him. Our enemies are getting stronger and stronger by the day, and we as a country are getting weaker. There's Trump talk in his blather when he goes on, but if you follow what he's saying, there's a core there. When do we beat Mexico at the border? They're laughing at us, at our stupidity. What did that agenda mean? It said we're going to care about things that concern Americans. We're going to go back to fundamentals. I am officially running for president of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. Beyond Trump's agenda was his freewheeling political performance. Voters were used to the stick-to-the-script candidates with poll-tested policy positions. They'd never seen anything like this. I teach political science. I'll tell you the story from one of my colleagues. He assigned Trump's announcement speech, but he assigned the prepared text version. And in rereading it and teaching it to the students, he said it fell completely flat. Second time I taught the class, I went and I got the actual transcript, which included all of the ad-libs, all of the asides that were not in the prepared text. They're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. And it's the, the second version is the one that broke through. And all the most memorable lines. The point is, what allowed him to break through is, the, is not appearing can. It was so different than anything they'd heard before. It just, it caused a sensation. Truth be told, his message included many of the positions he had been staking out for decades. Trump has for many years been talking about the need to have an orderly way of bringing people in. He's a business guy. He likes immigration, but he wants orderly immigration, and he doesn't want a million people coming in that are undocumented. He doesn't think that's good for the country. All of these things were very consistent with ordinary thought among ordinary Americans. He's been completely consistent on trade since he became a national figure in the 80s, and maybe before that. His agenda, in many ways, tracked a strain of conservatism reflected in the Reagan revolution, contract with America, Tea Party movement, Ross Perot's Reform Party, and Pat Buchanan's attempt to seize the GOP nomination from President George H.W. Bush. If you look at what Pat Buchanan was saying when he ran and primaried George H.W. Bush, the incumbent, there were elements of this, I call it national populism. Today we call for a new patriotism, where Americans begin to put the needs of Americans first, for a new nationalism, where in every negotiation, be it arms control or trade, the American side seeks advantage and victory for the United States. It was a chauvinism of the middle class and religion, family, tradition, and using America's resources. He didn't have the charisma or the experience of a, a prior antecedent. So when Trump came along and he tapped into that, and I saw that he had these demonstrable media and communication skills. He had a lot of money, had a celebrity status. I was attacked for saying that he would be a serious candidate for the nomination. Behind the scenes of the Trump show was a small staff working overtime to keep up with the boss. Corey Lewandowski, he's the one who gets on the early. It had to just be unbelievable amounts of work because 
there wasn't anybody else around him who was willing to do it. Number two was Hope Hicks. She was working doing PR for Ivanka's fashion company and they came to her and said, we need somebody to be a spokesperson for campaign. What do you know about politics? And she said, nothing, zero. And they said, you're perfect. I left the campaign fairly early because I thought I could be more effective uh, on Trump's behalf from outside the campaign, working on my own. Beyond that, I had no interest in a presidential campaign with Corey Lewandowski. Lynn Patton, an executive at the Trump Organization and longtime friend of Eric Trump, was excited to jump in. We were extremely naive. We did not know what we were doing. We just thought you go out there and if you, you know, do the right things and you know, commit to wanting to fix the country, people will elect you. Thank you. Thank you. Trump relied on family members to fly around the country as campaign surrogates. My father is not politically correct. He says what he means, and he means what he says. And I think that's the way the American people are. I think it's very refreshing to not have a politician campaigning. And I think it's, um, it's why his message is resonating so strongly. It wasn't just that Trump was politically incorrect. It was that he was waging war against political correctness, which his supporters could see was the way progressives silenced opposition to their policies. But some of Trump's wisecracks made even his supporters cringe. Among the many times his run was declared over was when he questioned why Senator John McCain, a Vietnam POW, was a war hero. He's a war hero, He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. He doesn't know when to stop and he doesn't know when enough is enough, and he has trouble putting a period at the end of sentences where he should. Recent history is replete with politicians done in by a single gaffe. So it seemed just a matter of time before the unapologetic Trump uttered something too outrageous to say in the race against an impressive array of GOP stars. I think it's the biggest field ever for the Republicans and maybe for either party. But you ha of the people who were serious contenders for the nomination, Jeb Bush obviously number one. Marco Rubio, everybody had said, he's going to be president someday. And then the conservatives said, well, Ted Cruz, my gosh, he was a brilliant student at Harvard Law School. He understands the law, he can out debate. He was a world-class debater. Carly Fiorina, she was a woman. That you'd, ben Carson is your ideal identity politics. All of those people were good candidates, and that makes the Trump ascendancy even more inexplicable. It's important to note that before Donald Trump, all of our presidents had either been governors, U.S. senators, congressmen, uh, or generals. Trump was this larger-than-life figure. The conventional politicians didn't take him seriously enough. They thought he was a cartoon character. <laughs> I didn't understand why very sophisticated politicians that were supposedly much more experienced in the sturm and drang of politics, or why they hadn't appealed to that constituency. But they were attacking him and they were just ceding enormous political ground to him. And all it did was just accentuate how different he was. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Different indeed. The first Republican debate on August 6th, 2015, was like none before. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account Only is Rosie several... O'Donnell. Some pundits were sure Trump's antics doomed his campaign. They were wrong. Laura, I'm looking at number one, we got Trump. Number two, we got Carson. Number three, we got Carly. And number four is Ted Cruz in a lot of the polls. Those are four yeah, insurgent candidates. <laughs> what? Not the, not the favorite of the uh, GOP establishment. I was hired by a collection of people who wanted the, a clean, cold, sterile look at the growing fields of Canada. And I told them the person on the rise, particularly in places like Iowa, New Hampshire, or South Carolina, was Donald Trump. And after I gave my presentation, they were really upset with me. We didn't hire you to tell us that. Maybe you should call him Conald Trump. Trump. The large field of conventional GOP candidates worked to the advantage of Trump, who deployed a strategy of asymmetrical rhetorical warfare to take out his flummoxed rivals one by one. Donald Trump wanted to get into a personal rivalry, 
controversy, tit for tat with every one of those candidates. And his attitude was, these people have pretensions about their place in society. They're sober and judicious. They have reputations. I don't. I want to get into a fight. I will call somebody horse face. I will call somebody a loser. I'll call so, and nobody else can do that because they're scared about their reputation. I have no reputation if, as you calibrate it. And that was a liberating experience. Bush is a low energy person. I'll take more energy tonight. I like no. that. Little Marco and they're worse than Lion Ted Cruz. I'm telling you. What's your name? My name's Lion Ted Cruz. I think that a lot of Donald's behavior is left over from the time he was a child. He has this bully attitude. I think he's gotten much better, actually. Donald is not warm and fuzzy. That's not the person that he is. He's a dynamic, in-your-face person. If you don't like him, you don't like him. If Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio had said exactly the things Trump did, Gordon, they would be finished. But once Trump like just blew him. himself up, you couldn't do anything to him. It was all downhill. He just said, you know what? You're right, I'm Cruz, so what? We need a crude person to cut through the pretensions, and that's what he did. Trump's over-the-top rhetoric was far from his only advantage against the conventional candidates. Trump, in the nomination phase, spent virtually no money on either broadcast or cable television advertising, which is unheard of. Jeb Bush, probably his leading competitor, spent $600 million on ads attacking Donald Trump, and it had no effect whatsoever. Meanwhile, the businessman got himself hours and hours of TV time for free. I think the whole key to being successful in politics is being interesting. The rally became his set piece, and they were so popular, and the crowds they drew were so large, and they were so unscripted that cable TV moved aggressively to cover them. And as he pointed out, that was worth tens of millions of dollars uh, of electronic advertising. So it was a completely unconventional approach, uh, but it was exactly right for the times. I never went to one, but I knew people who did, including some college professors. Guys, you could say, from taste, upbringing, and education were about as far from MAGA hat wearing rally goer you can imagine. And they went to rallies and they said that they had a ball and they just felt an energy like they'd never felt before. They would command enormous ratings. Why? Because people wanted to tune in realizing that he wasn't scripted, he wasn't handled. He was like a man working without a net. His tweets posted at all hours, rife with typos and multiple exclamation points, were as spontaneous as his rallies and made even more news. Trump realized what Twitter was, it was his voice and he was able to have his voice heard by lots and lots of people. And he was able to get his perspective out there. And you can rest assured there are lots of people in the world, including many in the media, who didn't want his voice to be heard. But it wasn't exactly presidential either. Many of his supporters wanted him to dial it back. People say this to me all the time, like, Lynn, can you please just get him to tweet less? And I always say to them, do you honestly think nobody said this to him? Do you honestly think his own kids, his own wife haven't said this to him? Of course they have, I've heard him. But at the same time, he's also been extremely successful by doing just that. In the boardroom, he always told it like it was. Trump's message on immigration and trade resonated with conservative voters, but he had a glaring vulnerability on one issue, the Supreme Court. The religious right had been serially disappointed by Republican-nominated justices who ended up siding with the liberals on questions like abortion. Why would they now put their faith in a crude, thrice-married philanderer who once said he was very pro-choice? The unconventional Trump closed the sale by promising to pick his justices from a Federalist Society-approved list. These people are all of very high, high intellect. Uh, they're pro-life. And so that's my list. On May 3rd, 2016, Trump took the Indiana primary to become the presumptive Republican nominee. But Roger Stone feared the Republican establishment would try to steal it from him at the convention. We did have a historical precedent where in 1952, Robert Taft, the senator from Ohio, showed up in Chicago with more than enough votes to win on the first ballot, but was denied victory by Dwight Eisenhower through the clever manipulation of both the Rules and the Credentials Committee. And heading into the 2016 convention, 
despite the fact uh, that Trump had rolled up massive victories uh, in the primaries and the caucuses and the state conventions and had enough votes to be nominated, there was an alliance of Ted Cruz and the Bushes and John Kasich and his other vanquished rivals, and they were openly talking about a strategy in rules and credentials to deny Trump the nomination. Stone believed he knew exactly who Trump needed. Paul Manafort was recommended by me and by others uh, as uh, probably the most experienced and capable convention politician in the country. Uh, convention politics is a very arcane uh, and specialized area. Very few people in the party in history have had that kind of expertise. But a convention challenge was small potatoes next to the dirty trick Hillary Clinton was cooking up. She approved a scheme to paint Trump as in cahoots with Putin. Her campaign operative manufactured, among other bogus evidence, the laughable Steele dossier. It said Putin was blackmailing Trump with a secretly recorded P-tape of Trump romping around urinating Russian hookers during the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. Though President Obama and his top intelligence officials knew of Clinton's skullduggery, his FBI opened a counterintelligence investigation into Trump's campaign, including undercover operatives, electronic surveillance, and an agent, Peter Strzok, who assured his FBI attorney mistress that Trump would never become president because we'll stop it. Strzok, by the way, also led the FBI's investigation into Hillary Clinton's mishandling of classified information Asking and homebrew email server. But Director James Comey gave her a pass. In her testimony to Congress, Hillary Clinton said she turned over all of her related emails, right? She said that. I saw that. The FBI director said Hillary failed to turn over several thousand work-related emails, including emails that were classified, right? Rigged system, folks. Unfortunately for Trump, political amateurs on his side did plenty to fuel suspicions that he might just be a Putin stooge, susceptible to blackmail. Don Jr. and son-in-law Jared Kushner met at Trump Tower with a group of Russians who claimed they had dirt on Hillary. Within minutes, they realized they'd been had. And even after Trump became the prohibitive favorite to win the nomination, his lawyer, Michael Cohen, was negotiating with Vladimir Putin's aides to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. His lawyer also brokered deals to buy the silence of Playboy pinup Catherine McDougal and porn star Stormy Daniels about their relationship with Trump. Those payoffs would become more reason for investigators to believe that Trump was a right target for blackmail, and Trump himself could not resist stirring the pot. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Meantime, Trump had a big personnel decision to make, his running mate. The conventional wisdom was that he's appealing to a white working class base in the Middle West, so he's obviously going to get a Ben Carson or Carly Fiorina or a woman or somebody, a non-white, to balance the ticket, but what he wouldn't do is get a similarly aged white male who was as just as conservative from the Midwest, and that's exactly what he did. I would like to introduce a man who I truly believe will be outstanding in every way and will be the next Vice President of the United States, Governor Mike Pence. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I think what he was thinking is all my traits that endear me to the MAGA base is still not quite enough to win. I still got to pick off the Republicans that didn't like Obamaism, and they think I'm reckless, that I'm volatile, that I'm uncouth, and I'm crude. Now, who in the political world is more sober, careful, predictable, has wonderful character, a decent person? It's Mike Pence. The Republican convention was the campaign's chance to push beyond Trump's reputation as the bombastic businessman and introduce him as a candidate who just cares about struggling Americans all across the country. The forgotten man, as FDR once put it. He asked Lynn Patton to tell her story to the nation. When I was working for the Trump family, I was introduced to a Manhattan delivery service for cocaine. 
Um, and it really was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me. Fortunately, somebody brought it to the attention of Eric Trump and he said, Lynn, sit down. He goes, because it's been brought to my attention that you're doing drugs. But the one thing we're not gonna do is get rid of you. He's like, because you're just, you're too good for this. And there's no question in my mind that it was an intervention that ended up saving my life. I personally pledge to you that Donald Trump knows that your life matters. He knows that my life matters. He knows that LGBTQ lives matter. He knows that veterans' lives matter. He, and he knows that blue lives matter. I kind of made it my goal to go out there and tell my story. And I thought it was my duty, quite frankly, to make sure that I did defend them because so many media outlets were claiming the opposite. The convention and VP pick, however, did little to change the accepted wisdom that Trump simply could not win. Public opinion surveys weren't promising either. Hillary Clinton's poll numbers are rising, so is attendance at her rallies, enjoying a double-digit lead according to the latest NBC Wall Street Journal poll. I was already on the Trump campaign in 2016 as one of the five polling firms and a senior advisor to Mr. Trump. And I showed up on the hallowed 26th floor of Trump Tower in his office. And he said at some point, when we're done in here, I want everybody to leave except Kellyanne. Very unusual for him. Everybody left, and he asked him to close the door, which he really never does. And I said, Mr. Trump, what's going on here? And we're running against the most miserable, joyless candidate in the history of presidential elections, Hillary. And we're starting to resemble her. And he snapped back, no, we're not. And I said, there it is, what's going on? And he said, everybody tells me that I'm a much better candidate than Hillary Clinton. I said, fact check, true, yes. He said, well, she's got the best people. And I said, well, she has the most people. There are about 1,000 people on her campaign. We have less than 100. And he said, um, I know that we can still win this. I said, of course you can still win this, but the polls are against you, and the window is closing. And right now, this campaign is mostly about you, to which Mr. Trump said, I know I get the best press coverage. And I said, well, you get the most press coverage. <laughs> and I let that sort of hang in the air. And I said, if you could agree to make the campaign, this election, even just a little bit more about Hillary Clinton, no one is going to go into the ballot box and see Trump or not Trump as the choices. They're going to see Donald J. Trump, Hillary Rodham Clinton. They have to cast aside everything they know and assume about Hillary Clinton and vote for her. That's a big gulp for many Americans. He said, can we do that? I said, yes, we can do that. I said, I don't think that's the way this campaign is being managed currently, but sure, we can do that. He said, how would you do that? And I said, listen, Hillary's got some deficits. Down ballot, female candidates are usually seen as fresh and new. Newbie looks at Hillary's fresh and new. You're the new kid on the block, politically. Number two, women candidates are often seen as beyond reproach, less corruptible, more ethical. Nobody sees Hillary Clinton that way. So you've already got advantages over her. He said, how would you approach it? So I saw I had the floor, I kept going. Said, Mr. Trump, here's how we win. We focus on the 10, 11, 12 states that Obama carried twice with more than 50% of the vote, that have not shown polling for a while, that had Hillary Clinton above 50% and staying there. And the third criterion and the most important one, while Obama was president, that state voted for a Republican statewide for governor and or senator. So we, we know they're not allergic to Republican leadership. In fact, when they were looking for a Republican chief executive as governor or senator, they chose a Republican. It's Florida, North Carolina, Iowa, Ohio. It's Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. It's states we ended up not winning, like New Hampshire or New Mexico or Colorado, but they all fit that description. And he said, do it. You're running the campaign, honey. You're my new campaign manager. And yes, he calls me, honey. I've been called far worse. And then I became campaign manager. I really didn't think at the beginning that he had a chance, but the momentum picked up with such, such steam. We execute on the strategies fairly quickly, making sure that Donald Trump and Mike Pence were going more to those states and those areas within a state where Republican had not been successful and dared not go for years and years. The man gets no sleep. 
I think I saw him sleep on the plane like once. But, you know, he's a machine. He has energy that people half his age don't have that I don't have. You would hear stories that he ate Big Macs and milkshakes. So that added to his aura that he was more than human in a toxic way even. I don't need sleep, I can eat whatever I want. My sure animal energy overcomes all obstacles. Invest in me and I will never stumble. The polls were narrowing, but Trump needed every vote he could get. While never Trump Republicans called upon the GOP rank and file to defect. His supporters attempted to clarify the real world stakes for America's future. One was Michael Anton. It was called the Flight 93 election. Of course, a reference to the passengers who stormed the cockpit and took down Flight 93 on 9-11, a plane that was likely targeted at the Capitol but crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, almost certainly because of the actions of some passengers. And it basically said Republican reluctance to support Trump is stupid, both because a Hillary Clinton presidency would be disastrous and because Trump's policies will actually be good for America and for the Republican Party and for the Republican voting base. And so you need to get behind him. And all of your hand wringing is foolish or worse. It got into the hands of Rush Limbaugh, who read it on the air. He basically, the entire three hours of his show, which had 20 million listeners. The first debate against Trump and Clinton was highly anticipated and did not disappoint. Maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes because the only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. paid... As undecideds pondered their binary choice, Hillary grossly. Clinton gave many of them a reason to vote against her. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Trump had referred to we the people as the forgotten man, forgotten woman, forgotten child. She referred to us derogatorily as deplorable and irredeemable. Trump seemed to be getting traction. Then came an October surprise many thought would torpedo his campaign. A videotape from his apprentice days in which he makes vulgar comments about women. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss them. I don't even know where. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. So I was with him when he found out about the Access Hollywood tape. It was a very confusing moment. I was standing right there. As the person who had to tell him about that tape's existence, and first we heard about it, then we read it in print, and he said, doesn't sound like me. Then we heard his voice, then we saw the tape the TV tape, so it went in that succession. No one knew how voters would react. So when Access Hollywood came along, the left was delighted, but they didn't really look at the situation. It was something that happened 10 years ago. It was trash talk, what Donald Trump called locker room talk. It was crude, but they expect Trump to be crude. Trump hadn't apologized for previous comments about Rosie O'Donnell and other women, but this time he did. I've said and done things I regret, and the words released today on this more than a decade old video are one of them. Anyone who knows me knows these words don't reflect who I am. I said it, I was wrong, and I apologize. Would it save the campaign? Saturday, October 8th, hours before we leave for that debate in St. Louis. The screaming headline said that Paul Ryan and the Republicans were trying to find a way to get him off the ticket. He said, can they do that? And I said, no. You couldn't, it's too late. A lot of the ballots have been printed and you're the nominee and he decided to fight. And he decided to fight for the people and not let other people define him. More than fight, he turned the issue against Hillary Clinton, who in years past had attacked women who accused Bill Clinton of sexual assault. Right before the second presidential debate, he held a press conference with four of them. These four very courageous women have asked to be here and it was an honor to help them. Trump stayed on the attack the rest of the evening. The people of this country are furious. In my opinion, the people that have been long-term workers at the FBI are furious. There has never been anything like this where emails and you get a subpoena, you get a subpoena, and after getting the subpoena, you delete 33 
thousand emails, and then you acid wash them or bleach them, as you would say, a very expensive process. So we're going to get a special prosecutor, and we're going to look into it because you know what? People have been, their lives have been destroyed for doing one fifth of what you've done, and it's a disgrace. And honestly, you ought to be ashamed of Secretary yourself. Clinton. At the time, he didn't know how determined the FBI was the to nail him. President. Struck texting. <laughs> That while he wanted to believe that Trump could not get elected, I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. Meantime, Kellyanne knew Trump could get elected. I was very secure about the changing polls in places like Wisconsin, where we had been down by 24, in Michigan, where it was always tight, in Pennsylvania. Hillary was not above 50 in any of those places. If she went to Pennsylvania, it was, it was with Jay-Z and Beyonce. And so she confused a Jay-Z and Beyonce free concert with, I'm with Hillary. So the more she ignored the people of the state, the more we kept going back to those states. So it wasn't luck, more methodical than people gave us credit for. We are going to make this decision now. The Fox News decision desk has called Pennsylvania for Donald Trump. This means that Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States, winning the most unreal, surreal <laughs> election we have ever seen. Although he was pretty surprised to win in 2016. He knew he had done everything right. No dream is too big, no challenge is too great. Nothing we want for our future is beyond our reach. America will no longer settle for anything less than the best. We must reclaim our country's destiny and dream big and bold and daring. Donald Trump believed that his election would be like every other election we'd ever had, where we had a tough competitive election, but in the end, despite the fact that we were Republicans and Democrats, that the country would unite around the president. But the president-elect was sorely mistaken. That's our house! That's our house! I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. That's next in episode five.